Hey, good morning, everyone. Welcome to worship. My name is Bliss. I'm one of the pastors here at Portico. We want to say a special welcome to those who might be joining us for the first time. Uh, if you are interested in getting more connected here at Portico, please feel free to send us an email at info at porticoseville.org. Uh, the normal rhythms of life uh, for us as a church, though different, have not changed. Uh, we're still gathering on Sundays to worship, though scattered in our individual homes. Uh, we're still gathering throughout the week in our community groups to pray for one another, to read scripture together, to reflect on all God is doing in our lives and to hear what he's doing in the lives of others. And if you'd like more information on how to get connected in any of those spaces, again, please send us an email at info at porticoseville.org. If you have been worshiping with us and joining in over the last few weeks, you're going to notice a, a little bit of a change of format over the coming weeks. Uh, today, you'll notice that we're beginning a new sermon series, The Promises of God, where you and I are going to be exploring together, reading and listening and reflecting on the promises of God in Scripture. Uh, these are the promises of God. They, they aren't transactional uh, formulas for how to get blessing here and now, but rather they are promises that reveal the heart of God and point us to and invite us to attune our hearts and our lives toward Jesus, our King and our Messiah, in whom all these promises find their yes. And in doing that, what the Lord longs to do is to give us a sturdy place of hope to stand both in the future and now. And we're going to see that in Jeremiah 29 and verse 11 this morning, uh, that the Lord longs to give us a sturdy place of hope for today and for the days to come. You're also going to notice a lot more different faces. Uh, our hope here is to incorporate more members of our church family so that you can see the people you have grown to love, that you've done life with. You're going to hear them read scripture. You're going to hear them pray. You're going to hear them reflect to tell stories of what God's doing, um, even in the midst of this space we find ourselves. And so with that, when we stand, I would invite you to stand. When we sing, sing. When we pray, pray. And let's together in the coming weeks reorient and continue to reorient ourselves to the immense, beautiful, real love of God revealed in Jesus. Thanks be to God. And now let's stand and let's join as we sing together.
this right. virtual meet and greet. So um, if you're on church online or if you're on Facebook or somewhere like that, feel free to comment or say something in the chat. Just say who you are, where you're from, and uh, yeah, things will get rolling again here in a few minutes.
What's going on, Portico family? It's Pastor Dez here. Hey, uh, have you ever experienced a season in your life where you begin to doubt God and the plans he has for you? Well, 2015 was that season for me. Uh, I began to experience a godly discontentment with my job. It was a great job. It provided for the family. It gave back to society, uh, but it wasn't life-giving for me. Uh, what I mean is that I had a desire to go into ministry and I, and I actually knew that God had given me this burning desire to proclaim his word, but things wasn't happening according to my plans. Um, in fact, it was an eight year gap <laughs> between the time I was called and the time I actually went into ministry. Uh, and it was, if I can be honest, in that season, uh, I began to doubt God's plans uh, for my life and a possibility for me to even be in ministry. Um, I entered into this uh, realm of hopelessness. But also it was in that season, unaware of by me, that 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 God was doing something that uh, he was molding me and he was maturing me for ministry. Uh, I, I remember one particular evening in the kitchen after work, uh, tired, uh, I received a call from Pastor Justin Conger of Portico Church. And um, and that day, it changed, it changed my life. Uh, and I remembered, and I was just thinking back to like, you know what, God's, God's ways are higher than our ways. He does give us a hope. He does give us a future. Today, Jeremiah is bringing us the God of hope, a word from God. And we will encounter people who found themselves in a rough season of life, exiled and enslaved in a foreign land and Jeremiah delivers delivers to them a word of hope maybe you found yourself in this season that we're in um not trusting god trying to figure out is there a future for me well can i encourage you this morning to lean into god's word lean into him and trust him and hear the words he has for you this morning. Let me pray. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for this word that you're going to bring to us. I ask you to be with Pastor Chris as he delivers this word. Encourage your people. May they see your goodness. May they see your grace. May they see your plan. May they see the, your, your see your promises. We thank you and we ask this in your son Jesus name. Amen. The book of the prophet Jeremiah. Jeremiah was an Israelite priest who lived and worked in Jerusalem during the final decades of the kingdom of southern Judah. He was called as a prophet to warn Israel about the severe consequences of breaking their covenant with God through their idolatry and injustice, and he even predicted that the empire of Babylon would come as God's servant to bring this judgment on Israel by destroying Jerusalem taking the people into exile. And sadly, his words became reality. Jeremiah lived through the siege and destruction of Jerusalem and witnessed the exile personally. Now, this book came into existence in a really interesting way. Chapter 36 tells us that after 20 years of Jeremiah's preaching in Jerusalem, God called him to collect all of his sermons and poems and essays and commit them to writing, which Jeremiah did by employing a scribe named Baruch, who wrote down and compiled all of this material into a scroll. Now, Baruch also gathered lots of stories about Jeremiah, and he linked all the pieces together. And so this is why the book reads like an anthology, a collection of collections. It's all been arranged to present this prophet as a messenger of God's justice and grace. 
So the book begins with God calling Jeremiah to be a prophet, and he's given a dual vocation. He will be a prophet to Israel, but also to the nations. And his words will both uproot and tear down, but also plant and build up. In other words, he's going to accuse Israel and warn them of God's coming judgment, but he also has a message of hope for the future. Now, this opening perfectly summarizes the first large section, chapters 1 to 24. It's a collection of Jeremiah's writings from before the exile. And the core idea here is that Israel has broken the covenant with God and violated all the terms of the agreement they made that are written in the Torah. And in a number of ways. They've adopted the worship of all kinds of Canaanite gods, building idol shrines all over the land. And Jeremiah develops the metaphor of idolatry as adultery and uses the language of prostitution, promiscuity, unfaithfulness to describe how Israel has given their allegiance to other gods. Jeremiah also repeatedly accuses Israel's leaders. The priests, the kings, the other prophets have all become corrupt. They've abandoned the Torah and the covenant, which has led to a tragic result, rampant social injustice. The most vulnerable people in Israelite communities, the widows, the orphans, the immigrants, were all being taken advantage of in clear violation of the laws of the Torah. And Israel's leaders didn't even seem to care. So a classic place where all of these ideas come together is in chapter Chapter 7, it's called Jeremiah's Temple Sermon. The Israelites are coming to worship their God in the temple as if everything is just fine, but outside the temple they are worshiping other gods, and some were even adopting the horrifying Canaanite practice of child sacrifice. And so Jeremiah makes his very unpopular announcement. The God of Israel is coming in judgment. He's going to destroy his own temple and punish Israel by sending an enemy from the north. This is an army that God would allow to conquer Jerusalem and as you read on, you discover he's talking about the great empire of Babylon. And so this all leads up to a transition in chapter 25. Israel hasn't turned back to their God. And so in the first year of Babylon's new king, Nebuchadnezzar, God tells Jeremiah to announce that the Babylonian armies are headed for Israel and all of its neighbors to conquer them and take them into exile for 70 years. He compares Babylon to a cup of wine filled to the brim with God's just anger at all of Israel's injustice and idolatry. And God will make Israel and the nations drink from this cup. Now, this chapter is key to the book's design because everything that follows is going to focus on Babylon's coming attack, first on Israel in chapters 26 to 45, and then on the other nations in chapters 46 to 51. The section about Israel first contains stories about how Jeremiah begged Israel to turn back, how he warned them right up to the last minute, but the leaders of Israel kept rejecting him. The section concludes with a large collection of stories about how Jerusalem was under siege and eventually destroyed by Babylon and about how Jeremiah was persecuted all through that time and eventually kidnapped and taken against his will to Egypt by a group of Israelite rebels. Now, right here in the middle, in between all of these dark stories of disaster and judgment, is a collection of Jeremiah's messages of hope for Israel's future. So he picks up on Moses' prediction that after Israel had broken the covenant and gone into exile, see Deuteronomy 30, God would not abandon his people. Rather, he would renew his covenant with them and transform their hearts. Jeremiah develops this promise, and he says that God is going to one day inscribe the laws of the Torah, not on tablets, but rather on the hearts of his own people. He's going to heal their rebellion so that they can truly one day love and follow him fully. And so one day, Israel will return back to the land, and the Messiah from the line of David is going to come, and that's when all nations will come to recognize Israel's God as the true God. So these chapters are showing that despite Israel's apostasy, God is not going to let Israel's sin get the final word. Rather, his own faithfulness will bring about the fulfillment of his promises no matter what. After this, we find the large collection of poems about how God is going to use Babylon to judge the nations around Israel. So Egypt, Philistia, Moab, Edom, Ammon, Damascus, Hazor. But then, surprisingly, the longest poems are saved for last, and they're about God's coming judgment on Babylon itself. 
So although God used this nation to execute his justice, God doesn't endorse their violence and idolatry. And so Babylon too will come under the standard of God's justice. And so Jeremiah denounces this nation's pride and injustice as well. Now, Babylon is larger than life in these poems. And it reminds us of the image of Babylon all the way back from Genesis chapter 11. Babylon has become the archetypal rebellious nation. In their glorification of wealth and war, God's going to give this nation over to its own destruction. The book concludes with a story taken from the end of the book of 2 Kings. It tells about Babylon's final attack on Jerusalem, how they destroyed the city walls and burned the temple and took the people into exile. The story shows how Jeremiah's warnings of judgment from chapters 1 through 24 were fulfilled. But then the chapter ends with a short story about the captive Israelite king Jehoiakim. He's heir to the line of David. And the king of Babylon releases him from prison and shows him favor and invites him to eat at the royal table for the rest of his life. And that's how the book ends. So it's a little glimmer of hope. And this recalls Jeremiah's promises of hope from chapters 30 to 33. God hasn't abandoned his people or the promise of a future coming king from David's line. And so while this book contains a huge amount of warning and judgment, the final words conclude with a note of hope for the future. And that's what the book of Jeremiah is all about. Good morning, church. Today's scripture reading comes from Jeremiah 29, uh, verses 10 to 14. For thus says the Lord, when 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will visit you and I will fulfill to you my promise and bring you back to this place. Verse 11, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me and I will hear you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and will restore your fortunes and gather you from all the nations and all the places where I have driven you, declares the Lord. And I will bring you back to the place from which I sent you into exile. This is the word of God. Would you pray with me this morning? Gracious Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the truth that we see in it. We thank you that it is inerrant, it is infallible. Lord, and we thank you that when you say that you will fulfill your promises, Lord, we know and we find comfort and rest in knowing that every promise that you say, every promise that we see in Scripture, we know that you will fulfill and you will hold. And so we thank you for that. Help us to rest in that. Would you help us to see um, that you are good and that you have plans for us? And so we trust in you. Uh, even when things don't seem to be going our way. We love you. We thank you. Praise in your son's name. Amen. Hey there, church family. Uh, thanks for tuning in. Pastor Chris here. It's a joy to serve you today. I am going to warn you, I'm about to threaten your understanding of one of the most popular verses in the Bible. We've used Jeremiah 29, 11 in a way that defines hope without struggle. But the real story of the Bible is that hope isn't avoiding struggle, but it's a joy in God on the other side of struggle. What will be on the other side of this pandemic? I don't know. I'm getting very humbled by my regular use of that phrase. When will we return to regular social and work life? I don't know. What will the economy be like when we return to normal life? I don't know. But the part of the promise today that is too often missed is that God knows. So let me focus in on just the one verse from Jeremiah 29, 11. You heard Pastor Daniel read it already from a different translation with some important context added in. But let's hear the core of the promise once again. I'm reading from my 1984 NIV translation. It goes like this. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. 
plans to give you hope and the future. This is our passage today and opens up our series on the promises of God. And it is a promise of God. And it is a promise to you. But at the same time, it is one of the most misused and misappropriated scriptures in the entire Bible. I told you at the beginning, I was going to threaten your interpretation of this verse. And that threat is very close to home. I'm going through it to me. Love this verse. In fact, let me show you. Um, here is a frame we have in the Atwell House in beautiful calligraphy. It's Jeremiah 29, 11, and 12. We love this. We went past it many times a day. I still love this verse, but I think it's even more lovely when the meaning is recovered in its proper context. So let me tell you why it is that we tend to blow it on this famous passage of Scripture. One, something we bring, and then something we miss. First, what we bring. We have a tendency uh, to leapfrog the first important part of the verse found in the first clause, which is the entire source of the satisfaction in the second clause. But why do we do this? The presence of sin in our lives still has a tendency to skew our vision. So we look at a verse like this and go immediately to a desire for immediate gain, rather than a desire for the sheer fullness of God's immense glory. What am I trying to say? We want the goodies from God rather than God. So our sinful minds, yes, if we're in Christ, those minds and hearts are saved, but they're still singed and not yet fully shaped into the full conformity of Christ himself, which is our goal in discipleship. So most of us read Jeremiah 29, 11, and we sentimentalize it at best, or demand an immediate favorable outcome from God at worst. In other words, if God doesn't immediately or at least imminently give me the no harm prosper part of the equation, then I quickly doubt his power, his presence, and his promise itself. I've been reading in Romans lately in my devotional time, and Romans 1 through 3 is one of the strongest arguments um, of the sinful corruption of, of humanity, the futility of religious works to remedy our predicament, and the need for the redemption of Jesus and the gift of his grace to save troubled sinners. And one such verse comes in Romans 1, 25. It says, they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served created things rather than the creator. Well, one of those created things is ourselves. And we have a sinful tendency to want immediate self-serving things rather than the ultimate prize, a relationship with God himself. I mention all this to simply say that this is why we tend to read passages like Jeremiah 29, 11, wrong. We, we read them with a sinful nature. We want things for ourselves. We want them immediately. And if we don't get them, we doubt God, we blame God, we doubt his promises. Our tendency to worship the creature, ourselves, is one of the reasons we tend to look at passages like Jeremiah 29, and jump right to the reward without the struggle. But God's promise remains airtight and solid in the midst of the struggle. It's a complete guarantee. But we have to understand it properly, both within its context and within the fulfillment it has in Jesus Christ. And so that's what we'll try to look at as we dig into Jeremiah's comforting promise to us, the people of God. So, let me take a shot at a big idea for this passage. To get the right promise of God and the assurance that comes with it, we have to get the right takeaway. So, here it goes. Um, if you remember one thing today, here it is. 
Prospering in the present isn't based on escaping trials, but enduring trials with hope based on God's sovereignty. And it's important to consider God's sovereignty from the past for the future. Okay? So let's dig in. Let's dig into that in Jeremiah 29, 11. What we have is a promise. And the first thing to say about a promise is that promises always have some future orientation. If I say to my children, I promise to take you to Disney World, it's safe to assume we're not yet at Disney World. We do not yet have the experience. It's in the future. So for us, the recipients of a promise, there's an air of waiting. How good are you at waiting? If you're like me, not very good. So how do you get better at waiting? Well, to put it bluntly, you wait. That's how you get better, you go through it. And you wait, and you learn on the job. I ran, I read about um, five weeks ago an article as uh, the pandemic was really just beginning to set in for Americans. And the article interviewed several people over 80, some even close to 100 years old, uh, with little bits of the history they went through and the history of outbreaks. Uh, people used to go through this a lot more than we are today. We're not used to it. The conclusion of the article was that prior generations who battled polio, smallpox, seasonal flu every year, all the time, prior to vaccination, had to learn to cope. They had to learn on the job by going through it. By just the nature of going through something, they were given opportunities to grow and gain experience. I don't say this by any means to downplay what we're going through. But many of us, we really are being blessed by the weight. It's on the job training for and hopefully to gain the virtue of patience. We're being blessed by learning how to wait on God's future promises. How? By waiting. And that's what the people of God had to do when they first heard this promise from the prophet Jeremiah. Consider the setting. This is written like 2,600 years ago. Let that sink in for a minute. Where are the people? What are they going through? The Israelites are slaves. They're exiled slaves. Essentially dragged from their homeland into Babylon. Their temple, the centerpiece of their worship and culture, destroyed. The people, in fact, have had to endure the popped bubble of false prophecy. There were those going around saying, don't worry. The exile will, will only be short-lived. And then here comes Jeremiah clearing up that misinformation, advising them, in fact, if you go to verse 7, we learn, he says to them, no, nah, sit tight. And in fact, uh, seek the prosperity of your new community because basically you better get comfortable and do some good with and for your captors because that will benefit them and you in the long run, but you're not going anywhere for a while, Jeremiah says. Sound familiar? In fact, we see in verse 10 of chapter 29 that they'll have to wait 70 years, 70. In other words, most of the generation listening to Jeremiah's promise they know in advance it won't be fulfilled in their lifetimes. And I don't want to push the passage beyond the boundaries of its context, but if you imagine, if you can imagine modern day Israelis, they might wonder about the fulfillment of promising promise or, 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 or prospering with the elimination of harm. They've had, the, they've had a hard history. They live to this day under constant threat from enemies. But then nonetheless, there's this promise. I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Let me suggest to you now, if I haven't done so already, 
that the other problem in our misuse of this verse is we actually skip over this powerful statement of the sovereignty of God. I know the plans. Yahweh, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of the Trinity, and the God of Jesus, knows the plans. I told you at the beginning, I'm struggling to know the plans. You are struggling to know the plans. Some of the finest minds in epidemiology, statistics, economics, and government policy are struggling to know the plans. And God says, I know the plans. And let me suggest to you that he's not saying, I know the plans in the way some of the best of us might when we would say, I know the plans. When we say, we know the plans, we mean, well, I have relative experience. I'm, I'm pretty skilled at this. I'm your best option among decent options. God says all that on steroids of perfection, but he adds this component. Not just, I have experience, but he's saying, I am in flawless operational control of the plans. And I'm doing so in the past, present, and the future. I'm not bound by time. I am, and I know the plans. So in the past, God says, I put you Israelites in this fix of exile to fix you, and I'm on my plan of refinement. I know what I'm doing. I haven't made a mistake. We can look to the past and see many things that look like a loss and count them as a win in the plan of God. Jesus, 2,000 years ago in the past, when dying in love for our sins, said, it is finished. Not I'm finished, by the way, but it is finished. What did he mean? God's missionary plan to send a substitute sacrifice for sinners. That rescue plan was finished. The atonement of the life and death of Jesus was finished, but what was it? It was a plan. God, in the form of Jesus on the cross, is basically saying, I know the plan, I knew the plan, I know it inside and out, so I know it's finished. I know the plan, and it is accomplished. God, through Christ, in the past, knew our plan of salvation and accomplished it. We can be assured, or we could say, have hope in the efficacy of Christ's work because of his definitive, competent statement in the past on the cross that he knew the plan and he finished it well. In the present, we have the supreme competence of the word of God and his own great statements of absolute sovereignty. I know the plans, God is saying. We know that when God reveals his name as I am to Moses in Exodus 3, 14, he's saying that his knowledge is built on ultimate competence and capabilities as the self-existing one. God depends on no one or nothing for his very eternal existence. We also learn that he's the sustainer of all things. He's the I am. He holds it all together. Colossians 1.17 confirms it. It says, He, the I am, is before all things. In him all things hold together. He sustains and operates all plans. We also learn from God's describing himself as I am that he is immutable or unchanging. A fact confirmed in places like Hebrews 13.8 which says, he is the same yesterday and today and forever. It's unnecessary for him to change. He doesn't have to become something other than what he is. God is our perfect plan, knower and sustainer and fulfiller. So much of the hopefulness of Jeremiah 29 is quickly skipped over when we skipped it. God knows the plans. That's essential information. 
our present satisfaction is that we know the one who holds the universe and works out all things for good for those who love him. That's, by the way, from Romans 8, which is also an often misinterpreted scripture and also is covered later in this series. But let's get to the future orientation of this passage. Jeremiah continues, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and the future. God's sovereignty also gives us a confident hope based on the future. But let's consider again the people of Israel. With all they've been through, it might have them asking, where is the fulfillment of this prospering without harm? Seventy years after Jeremiah declares this prophecy, the people of God return from exile, but that's not the end of their trials. We're hard-pressed to find prospering and, and future hope. After Israel faced the Babylonians, then came Alexander the Great, and then the dreaded Romans of Jesus' own day. Then you have Arab occupation. You have a Nazi holocaust, to name just a few more trials for God's people. So with all that trial, all that waiting, how can we be confident? How can they be confident? But how can we then be confident on the promise? Well, this is where Jesus and the apostles come in with the answer. Jesus is the ultimate fulfillment of Jeremiah 29, 11. All of the hopes physically, land, returning home, end of exile, end of slave status, and spiritually, shalom, peace, hope, love, removal of sin, are fulfilled in Jesus. Jesus made sure to tell us in places like John 14, 2 through 3, that he's going to prepare a place for us. And when the time is right, he's coming back to take us there. Jesus speaks of our future as a place where there is no loss or theft or devalue, devaluing of any source of joy. Just read Matthew 6, verse 20. He speaks of heaven as a place of joy and rewards over and over. John, who was one of the closest brothers of Jesus, from his vision in Revelation 21, gives us a picture of, her, of a very earthy paradise. John shows us that God has plans for the physical world to redeem it back to a place of complete joy. Yes, to have a complete fulfillment of Jeremiah 29, we need the person and work of Jesus. Because of Jesus, God's ultimate fulfillment of Jeremiah 29, 11. Prospering in the present isn't based on escaping trials, but enduring trials with hope based on God's sovereignty. And it's important to consider God's sovereignty from the past and for the future. Our future rests in Jesus' death on the cross for my sins in the past and his eventual return bringing heaven in his entourage. Our hope no more depends on our living to see the end of this pandemic than it did for the Israelites to see the end of exile. Think about that for a second. Even if I'm in exile to this pandemic and never see the end of the season, I'm not lost. My God knows the plans for me. And those plans will have me prosper without harm. And that heavenly era will know no end. Our hope, just like Jeremiah's exiles, remains in the sovereign plans God knows, operates, and sustains. And what's more, we have been told the good news about Jesus. There's actually a very important hermeneutical question. That's a fancy way of saying an interpretive question that we need to ask and we need to answer. And here it is. How can Gentile Christians like most of us appropriate a covenantal promise that was originated to Israel 
out in the Old Testament. How can we appropriate that to us today as a means of hope? Is that in bounds? Can we do that? Pastor John Piper points out that Jesus at the Last Supper raised the cup and said he had authority to institute a new covenant in his blood through his sacrificial death for our sins. And then in 2 Corinthians 1.20, we're told that no matter how many promises God has made, even this one in Jeremiah 29.11, they are yes in Christ. So if you're trusting Jesus, God's man and God's plan, through endurance, trial, pain, sorrow, suffering, this future hope and promise is yours. It is a yes promise to you. I can prosper now because I look back on promises kept that are now mine in Jesus. I can prosper now because I have a powerfully present ministering God who is sovereign and knows the plans. I can prosper now in hope that ultimately, and even if that means I succumb here but gain heaven, I will have a future in Christ. That's quite a promise, quite a hope. That is such good news. As I close, would you consider what this means for you? If you're able, you know, I mean, not if you're driving or something like that, but close your eyes and ask God's Spirit to reveal new truths to you, help you to believe and trust God through Jesus. Convict you of sin. H have you been a bit panicked, worried? Go ahead and say you're sorry, that you haven't trusted him as you should, but know that God is quick to forgive and provide spiritual resources so that we can stand once again in his grace. Would you pray with me as we close? Father God, we love you and we know that you hold the plans. We know that you are absolutely sovereignly in control. You are the great I am. You're the alpha and the omega. You are not bound by time. You exist in the past, the present, and the future. That's mind-boggling but you are in all places at all times. You are magnific magnificent. Your glory is immense and beyond our wildest dreams of wonder. And we love you. And we look at a God like that that holds and sustains it all together and say, you know the plans. I don't, but you do. And yeah, we go through harm and hurt and we go through trials in this day and age, but we know that you fulfilled this promise and the future orientation of it is in Christ Jesus, who is preparing a place for us without harm, a place where, yes, we will prosper forevermore and know no pain, know no sorrow. And we're so thankful. We're so thankful that you know the plans, you knew them on the law, you knew them on the cross, you rose from the dead to verify they were true. So Jesus, um, I pray that we'll be a people of, of Jeremiah 29 11 and the hope that it brings to sustain us. Not in the absence of trials, but in the midst of them. You are not off your throne. You are not surprised. You have not made mistakes. And we are yours. And if we trust you, for those of us who trust you, we have this hope and this airtight promise. We love you. We pray, God, that you would place this truth in our hearts. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Let's stand back up and continue singing together. And the flesh will fail. Bones will break. Leaves will steal, the earth will shake, the night will fall, the light will fade, the Lord will appear and take away because of His great love. We are. 
I'm placing my hope in Jesus. We are placing our hope in Jesus. We are placing our hope in Jesus. I am putting my hope in Jesus. We are placing our hope in Jesus. We are placing our hope in Jesus. We are placing our hope in Jesus. Amen. Thank you for worshiping with us today. Uh, before I give the benediction, I want to invite us into a few different ways to respond to the good news that we just heard. Uh, the first is through the giving of tithes and offerings. Thank you so much for those who continue to be generous during this season. Uh, you are allowing us to be the hands and feet of Jesus to a community that needs it, to, that needs to hear not only the good news of Jesus, uh, but to experience uh, the tangible hands and feet that his church can be during this time. Uh, if you are looking for ways to give, uh, if you'll head over to porticoseville.org slash give, and there we have listed uh, how to give through our app, how to give online, how to mail in checks. But I also want to take a moment to speak to those who might be finding themselves in a place where they are in need of the generosity of others. Please reach out. Please let us know. If you go to porticoseville.org, we have reformatted our landing page uh, to reflect the current crisis that we are in. Uh, there you can find a form that you can fill out to receive both financial help, but also to connect and just talk to a pastor. So whatever help you need, we would love to help you however we can. Uh, finally, I'd love to invite us into a response to the good news that was preached by Pastor Chris this morning. Uh, Jesus is our hope. Uh, he's our hope for a steady, guaranteed future. And he's our hope for right here and now. The hope we have in Jesus is not something that we have to sit around and wait for, but rather it's something that Jesus longs to give us here and now if we will just invite him in. And so I wonder... As we think about our lives, as we think about our current situations, I wonder where those places are where we are in desperate need of hope. The good news of the resurrection is that Jesus enters into the dead places. And what he does is he brings with him life. He doesn't avoid the hard and dark places, but rather he enters into them and he brings with him the very life of God for you and for me. And so where are those dead places? As you think about your life, even in the midst of quarantine, are you in need of hope? Uh, in your relationships? Are you in need of hope in your current circumstances, in the anxieties of today or the anxieties of tomorrow? Where are those dark places that you desperately need to see Jesus enter into and bring life? And I wonder if this week, as we enter into this week, that what we would take with us is just that simple prayer, come Holy Spirit, give to us the gift of hope. Stir up in us a hope that looks beyond our current circumstances and looks toward God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. May we begin every single morning this week with that prayer, come Holy Spirit. May we, may I be a person, may we be a people of hope. And then may we wait because the God of hope brings with him hope in the form and the person and the work of Jesus. Thanks be to God. Now, if you would, and if you're able, please stand, hold out your hands and receive this benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, have a good week. We'll see you next Sunday.